Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did. They, they predictively absolutely got it correct. They were very insightful, uh, much l more so than the majority of uh, people today. And a lot of that is based on their educations. And we'll talk about some of that maybe uh, later on in the third segment if we get an opportunity to. But uh, just to give you some highlights as we continue this course of the national religion now in America being paganism, I will just do a little bit of a review uh, from last week, and I'll point you back to last week's program, as well as some of the other uh, aspects of change that was actually going on in the mid to late 1600s. And then, as we talked about in other programs in the 1700s, when we started to see that we were transitioning from Reformation to Enlightenment. And that Enlightenment, what did that mean? What was happening with that? So let's go back just a, a tad, because when we look at the ancient religions outside of Judaism, what we see is that the majority of the practices, the religious practices that are um, tied even politically to empires, kings, peoples, gods, little g, and all that was culturally acceptable involved a lot of sex and sexuality. Now, it was only in certain cultures that these practices were religiously demanded. Interesting. So we talked about last week just a, several of those examples, and uh, it was interesting to me that uh, while I was uh, just reviewing some other videos and watching some uh, uh, people that I enjoy watching and learning from, is that uh, Pastor Doug Wilson, in his Ask Doug series, was asked about, are the Greek gods real? And so I have a link to the exact title and that program in the references for you. Uh, you can find it there at samueladamsreturns.net. And he takes anyone that is willing to put ears on and listen through the fact that, no, the uh, Greek gods as they're defined are not real, but, uh, and I'm putting the but in there, in that the answers yes from the realities of the spiritual world. We don't talk about that too much in America. It's problematic, again, from the pulpits that we miss that, that there are, as it was, and as Doug uses the example out of Daniel, there's actually demons that are tied to nations. Uh, there was the demon tied to Persia that the angel had to battle. And that is very real. The fact that there are demons active in our world, uh, they are taking and they are even tied to what is going on in different nations. And you could go back to all that has occurred in that ancient history, in those ancient religions, and when you study demonology in any degree whatsoever, yeah, that, that's the battle. And as Paul tells us in Ephesians, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against powers and principalities. And these are all defined within the spiritual world. So it's very real. And when we take and we look at then what happened with Christianity, what Jesus did, not Christianity as a name of a religious entity, but as the actual acting 
living, prospering people who have a direct relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ's work on the cross, and especially his resurrection, and then his ascension to that place which he is now Lord and sovereign over heaven and earth. He claimed it. He did everything to deserve it. So this is what comes down to the battle lines for us. Uh, We can take and bark about all of the political aspects of what's going on out there, but quite frankly, the whole idea of the national religion in the United States is, as I noted last week, no different in its forcing and paying for the implementation of that religion, no different than Rome did. And then uh, there is another, uh, (laughs) this week I I watched uh, another video on a book that is very interesting on Christian resistance. I've only looked at uh, the the book's uh, outline and listen to the author interacting on it, and there's a link to that as well in your um, in the references at samueladamsreturns.net, and that's the one on battling Leviathan. The fact is, is that the author points out uh, Jesus was the first Christian resistance, if you will, and what he stood up for, and he resisted everything that was of world domination. He, everything that was in the humanism of Judaism, of that whole transition, that Judaism was no longer acting as that secure place to find God, but as that place to take and just lord over people. So how does this all, uh, in this first segment, begin to uh, look at what happened from the time of the pilgrims, the time of the Puritans coming to these United States? Well, as you have heard me speak before, that we saw that Harvard, in understanding that Massachusetts colony was settled in 1630, and Harvard came into existence in 1636, only six years later, that there was a real meaning as to why they created the university in such a manner. And I am giving you another reference that I think is absolutely superb in relationship to what happened to Harvard and and also upper education in general, and what the purpose of higher education really should be uh, in the links again at samueladamsreturns.net. I think that you will find that not only do I talk about in other programs where Harvard started taking and moving away from its Puritan heritage and started moving into uh, the process of what was the fear of the um, Puritans, in that being the uh, enthusiasm or the beginnings of a radical reformation of the Reformation, which ultimately came into being as uh, the Enlightenment. And we're going to talk about the Enlightenment a, a little bit more and what happened within the context of the um, the nation, what happened in the churches, what happened in education, and then what allows in appropriately the freedom of conscience to the extent that when the American pulpits started to take and compromise into all of the enlightenment, into the social gospel, into all of that which happened in the 19th century, the 1800s, 
we saw that that even got worse towards the end of the 19th century in that government now was taking over those areas that the church, Christians, believers no longer wanted to take care of or because of the major shift in theology never got involved in. They did not understand the depth of the scriptures and what it meant from that idea that Christ is Lord over everything, over all time, over all businesses, over all government, and as you often hear me say, is that they did not prepare believers to act accordingly within the context of our society. One interesting revelation in uh, the video that I'm sharing you from a former guest, the uh, president of New St. Andrews College, you can see the reference to his program that he was at here with me, as well as a lecture that he gives on education at the founding era. One thing that he said that I know of from studying Sam Adams and other founders, but was very poignant for the shift of allowing for a national religion protected by the First Amendment. That being that Harvard and others of those schools were initially designed to develop people that would be godly to preserve the culture. Now, let me say that again uh, and paraphrase again, is that Harvard and the other initial colleges or universities were designed for fundamental Christianity and deep understanding education so that the people would be able to preserve the culture and not become consumed by what was happening in Europe, what was happening on the continent. And I've talked about that before and how Lord North and others said that if they could make Americans uh, as frivolous and engaged in all of the activities of the continent of Europe, they'd forget about their liberty. And oh, how we have. So uh, it's going to be interesting as we delve into this a little bit more in the third segment and talk about uh, what was going on in the Enlightenment and how that then set up the deck for uh, the players when we move into the 20th, the end of the 19th and the 20th century. So let me see here. In the next segment, as we're preparing to move over to that in the next minute, I'm going to take you on a journey once again with one of my favorite debaters during the New York Constitutional Convention that being Melanchthon Smith. And once again, the parallels that are occurring, uh, maybe not the parallels, but let's say the predictiveness of Melanchthon Smith to that which is happening right now, including Nancy Pelosi's husband buying stock in a deal that then was voted on, and so on and so forth, to the expansive and extensive departments that are in government to the mechanisms of a uh, w what Congress looks like and that it's deficient in being able to represent us and what happens with all that. So let's uh, come on back in the next segment when we dive into Melanchthon Smith 
because he had the mind of Sam Adams and the Anti-Federalists. See you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this second segment of Samuel Adams Returns, those Anti-Federalists. Yes, you know the rest. They got it absolutely correct. This is Tom Navolis, your host, and you can find all of the program archives at SamuelAdamsReturns.net. If you have any questions or ideas that we can discuss or interesting guests that might want to be on the program, uh, please contact me at tom at samueladamsreturns.com. So with that, let's uh, begin to talk about Melanchthon Smith. I, I enjoy talking about him. I have not only my uh, handy-dandy copy, well-used, well-marked-up uh, uh, yes, it is. The Anti-Federalist Papers and the Constitutional Debates. Uh, we'll get into this here in a little bit with Melanchthon Smith. But I want to set up the scene <clears throat> for you. Is that, once again, we're getting into the idea that uh, these debates went on. And you have to understand that this was New York. And New York was, what, virtually the last to take and give in to the Constitution. They, they debated heavily enough, and although you had the likes of Hamilton arguing for the Constitution, there are a number of uh, areas that uh, it, Langton Smith really nailed on here, and I wanted to bring us to these in... in some interesting ways because what Melanchthon Smith was constantly challenging Hamilton. Hamilton was all about taking and uh, you know pushing forward on this on this Constitution. As you well know, he wrote a good a significant chunk of the Federalist Papers. But I think that uh, Melanchthon Smith had a couple very interesting questions right up from the from the front that. Uh, were good arguments in relationship to the concessions that uh, Hamilton even made, and that uh, it was like, come in our terms, it would be, come on, what are you thinking? So it was uh, one area that Melanchthon Smith talked about here was very important, is that he was seeking a uh, to understand and ask the question discussions that, uh, boy, we all need to take a look at this document. Uh, and look, a lot of people have sacrificed a lot for the union. And what does it mean to really keep the liberties of our country? And uh, it, it's like, where is it that this national government outside of the Confederation is going to preserve that for us? So Melanchthon Smith, he just kept asking uh, what was wrong with the old confederation and just moving through all of those different points on the uh, debates. And as uh, he looked at that, uh, I'm trying to find for you just this one spot uh, that uh, when he did comparisons of other republics, uh, he's, it always comes down to the basics of uh, people not having a strong uh, moral integrity that absolutely caused their governments to fail, even those that were uh, former republics. Now, he was uh, pleased in the debate that uh, the honorable gentleman, that being Hamilton, had himself shown that the intent of the Constitution was not a confederacy, but a reduction of all states into a consolidated government. So when we continue to argue for federalism, when we continue to argue for um, what it means for the uh, elected to act constitutionally, when we consider all of the areas that we're going to talk about in the third segment in relationship to how 
uh, our moral concepts shifted from that of the Puritan fathers and even in education, we have here Hamilton actually taking and acknowledging within the arguments during the New York Convention that the intent of the Constitution is to assume the states and to consolidate the government. And, uh, you know, Melanchthon Smith was delighted that he actually said that and that, uh, in fact, they called themselves, this is where uh, Melanchthon Smith tried to take and get the language right in that the those called the anti-federalists in our time were in fact and actually the federalist and those who advocated for the constitution were in fact the anti-federalist so i think that was pretty good that uh, melanchthon smith challenged him uh, right there right up front in front of everybody else and that uh, it it always comes down to a confederated republic has all the internal advantages of a republic. And Smith quotes ideas from Montesquieu in relationship to that. Uh, but what we see is the continuation in the arguments then uh, of Hamilton. And yet Smith continues to come back with looking at that uh, the Constitution, it, it, as it would be adopted, there's going to be a number of honorable and lucrative offices to be filled, and we ought to be cautious lest the expectancy of some of these should influence us to adopt it without due consideration. So what he was looking at is, once again, people eager to participate in the bureaucratic state. He was setting up the idea that, yeah, there would be a swamp. And let me take this direct quote uh, during this debate from uh, Melanchthon Smith. He says, we may wander, or wand wonder, he said, in the fields of fancy without end and gather flowers as we go. It may be entertaining, but it is all of little service to the discovery of truth. We may, on one side, compare the scheme advocated by our opponents, that being the Constitution, to golden images with feet of part of iron and part of clay. On the other hand, to a beast dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, having great iron teeth, which devours, breaks in pieces, and stamps the residue with its feet. And after all, said he, we shall find that both these illusions are taken from the same vision, and their true meaning must be discovered by sober reasoning. And that's pretty interesting. He's quoting out of Daniel in relationship to the Constitution or in, in that whole idea of what? Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So he agreed with the honorable gentleman, that being Hamilton, that the perfection in the system of government was not to be looked for. If that was the object, the debates on the one hand before might soon be closed. But he would observe that this observation applied with equal force against changing any system, especially against material and radical changes. Fickleness and inconsistency, he said, were characteristics of a free people. And in framing a constitution for them, it was perhaps the most difficult thing to correct this spirit, that being of fickleness and inconsistency, and guard against the evil effects of it. He was persuaded it could not be altogether prevented without destroying their freedom. And that's what we have going on. And, and as we take and even go into the ideas of here's, you know, trying to fix this in any small indisposition in the habits of the body, fixing the patient in a confirmed consumption, this fickle and inconsistent spirit was the more dangerous in bringing about changes in government. 
the instinct that has been adduced by the gentleman from the sacred history was an example and a point to prove this. The nation of Israel, having received a form of civil government from heaven, enjoyed it for a considerable period, but at length laboring under pressure which were brought upon them by their own misconduct and imprudence, instead of imputing their misfortune to their true causes and making proper improvement of their calamities by a correction of their errors, they imputed them to a defect in their constitution. They rejected their divine ruler and asked Samuel to make them a king to judge them like other nations. So you got to watch what you ask for. And what we're seeing here now is that We've opened the doors in so many different ways to uh, asking for all these other nations to come in. I, I, I think that uh, a Tucker Carlson yesterday, or no, not yesterday, earlier this week, he had on something uh, that was really interesting about the Immigration Act of 1965 and how that began the destruction of the uh, American people, the uh, those that came from our foundational heritage, and that in a number of years, and he has the charts and all of that, we won't even have any Americans that were originally Americans based on the growth path that was put in place from 1965. Well, Tom, what does this have to do with um, a national religion? Well, when we see what Melanchthon Smith was talking about in the all the different areas of potential corruption and the fact that our liberties are no longer secured because of the way that the federal government has from an outside pressure mechanism been consuming the states, it is a definitely predictive result of what Melanchthon Smith was talking about and the other anti-federalists were talking about how the federal government would utilize money, it would utilize bureaucracy to assume the states. In another program, uh, or I'll have to see. I think I have the reference for you. I'm talking this one off the top of my head. But at one point, I did talk about Melanchthon Smith arguing against the Constitution because we have insufficient representation. And uh, I'll have to bring that back up a few weeks from now as we finish up this series. But when we're looking at the truth and idea of a secure conscience that is individual between you, each person and God, it does open the door then for multiples of uh, religions to be able to participate by virtue of someone's conscience. Now, the intent, as it is brought up in some of the other uh, areas that I talk about in Christian resistance, but in this defeating the lie the the uh, the Leviathan in particular, and is that uh, Leviathan, excuse me, in defeating the Leviathan, that in that discussion, it goes all the way back in that in Protestantism in general, and even uh, all the way back to Constantine, which we'll talk about in the next segment, is that in Constantine, the idea was a free conscience. And we'll talk about uh, the maxims from Milan as we get into the next segment as well. So with that, because we have not maintained the sovereignty of God in our churches, let alone in those that we prepare to go to local and national offices, we have the development of a national religion that is being foisted on us and paid for. And it will take about another week or two to actually get to that final definition and bottom line. And we'll talk about it a little bit in the 
ending of the next segment as to what we will do about it. But Sam Adams and the Anti-Federalists clearly understood it, as did Melanchthon Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this third segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those Anti-Federalists did predictably get it correct. In the last segment, we were talking about Melanchthon Smith, so I highly recommend that all of those that are listening to this shorter version go to samueladamsreturns.net and uh, get the whole program there. Also, if uh, any of you find this continuing to be of interest to yourselves, please uh, sign up for the newsletter Take and pass along the information how to sign up for the newsletter at samueladamsreturns.net. As well as, uh, again, if it is meaningful, we would greatly appreciate any contributions that you can make uh, to help us stay on the air. Because at this point uh, in our six-month review uh, of the programming out there in St. Louis Market, uh, we may not continue after February, but we'd love to hear from you and uh, tell us what you uh, like or don't like about the program. Not that I'll ever change what I'm doing, but, you know, we're always interested in what folks have to say. So we're going to continue, as I mentioned in the first segment, in thinking about um, the what happened. We, we have such a... it's all, So let me... Let me do this, is that when we talk about the establishment of a national religion, everybody that we hear the arguments, oh, well, um, the United States is a Christian nation. The United States was uh, designed uh, from that biblical perspective and point of view, the founders being uh, the Puritans and, and all of the folks that came here for religious liberty. Well, yes and no. Remember that down in Virginia, it was not founded for any type of religious liberty. It was founded for economics, purely, solely. And as you look at then New York, which was with the Dutch that settled that in Pennsylvania area as well, that was also economically driven. So when we start looking at how we define the uh, United States being a Christian nation, it is incumbent upon us to clearly understand that for the most part, especially in New England, the beliefs of Christ were predominant. The idea, the philosophy uh, of life was biblical in the whole concept of the full authority of Christ in every aspect of life. And that is what Harvard, as I mentioned in the first segment, as well as other universities were designed to take and do and develop and continue the culture which those, especially in New England, and even as uh, in William and Mary, which was surprising to me, if you take and uh, listen to Nate's discussion, the links are, again are down there in the references for samueladamsreturns.net, what we have is the transition of changes even in the 1700s. We went through from the 1500s with Luther into that time of Reformation. And as I mentioned in the first segment, it, we saw even in the 1700s the push for Reformation of the Reformation. And that Reformation, as I indicated, was the Enlightenment. Now, I constantly say that there was no Enlightenment, that it was the, uh, I don't know, stupidity, uh, selfishness, the desires to free themselves 
of anything that had to do with God uh, in relationship even to Protestantism. We saw there were battles between Anglican, the Scottish Reformers, uh, the Catholic Church, all of these had their clashes in Europe as well as uh, across into other continents. And as we saw, there were beginnings, a development, and increasing growth of the likes of the Muslim world, Mohammedans, to the extent that in America we had the what war that Thomas Jefferson oversaw with the Barbary, Barbary, not Barbary, but the Barbary pirates. They're in the Mediterranean, and we have, therefore, the song, The Halls of Montezuma to the Shores of Tripoli. So, uh, interesting. But who was it? Who, who brought us into this, and what was it that affected the thinking and the philosophies in America to the extent then that we would have a transition in our religion, our Christian movements, to the point of where it is today. Well, I know there's a lot of other folks that are out there that have done a lot of great work on all of this idea of the Enlightenment and its relationship to Christianity, but I want to bring this to bear specifically on the idea that we now have a national religion and I want to continue to set that framework for you as I take and I bring you into maybe next week is when we really talk about and give the case issues, the specifics on where the federal government is funding this. And I know I'm not being a conspiracy theorist on this, but I will show you documentation in the United Nations for the establishment of a national religion and a global religion, including environmentalism is all part of that. So let's get on with here and discussing these various uh, Enlightenment persons that brought us to where we are today because now we have a hodgepodge of uh, philosophical thought and which we should and were allowed to have and should continue to have free conscience. So in having free conscience, I'm going to put up from the Belcher Foundation uh, several different articles, both in uh, reference to a sermon as otherwise. So there was this gentleman by uh, Jean Renaud Albert in uh, the 1700s, 1717 to 1783. Uh, he was um, educated in mathematics and he co edited the Encyclopedia, for which uh, he authored over a thousand articles. Criticism uh, he was accused of being too anti religious saw him resign and devote his time to other works, including literature. Uh, he turned down employment from both Frederick II of Prussia and Catherine II of Russia. Then we have, so the important piece here is he was already writing and he was against religion. So you're going to see that the Enlightenment, not only uh, was it important and we're not, yeah, next week I'll get into the Enlightenment pastors, what happened with the Scottish Enlightenment and changed a lot of that thinking as well. But these are the, 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 the key button people. Cesare uh, Beccari. Now, he was an Italian, and he was uh, taking and he was talking about punishment to be secular rather than based on religious judgment for sins and for legal reformations, including the end of capital punishment and judicial torture. Then you have George Louis Leclerca Buffon, and he was a buffoon, and he came from a, ranked, a highly ranked legal family, and his whole idea in, and what he contributes with his works on natural history, in which he rejected the biblical chronology 
of the of the past in favor of a earth being older and flirted with the idea of species could change so this guy was in the 1707 to 1788 so he was long before darwin in taking and looking at uh, the whole idea of species in, in that concept then that darwin picked up on Condesert. This is Jean Antonio Nicolas da 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 Condesert. Okay, he he was very influential in science, mathematics. He produced uh, important works, and he wrote for the Encyclopédie. Uh, he worked in the French government, became deputy of the Convention in 1792, where he promoted education and freedom for enslaved people. And he died during the reign of terror. Um, he was a humanist. Then you have Diderot, another Frenchman. And his was, uh, he entered the church before leaving his work as a, for a law clerk. He achieved fame in the Enlightenment chiefly for editing uh, a lot of the text of the Encyclopedia. He took over, uh, which took over 20 years of his life. He wrote a lot on science, philosophy, arts, as well as fiction. And uh, so he was very influential in that. Edward Gibbon. Gibbon was the author of the most famous works in English, History and Decline, the Fall of the Roman Empire. Many of us know that. It's not the movie, folks, that you've seen out there as well. So he was a historian. Herder, John, Johann Godfrey von Herder. His uh, importance here in 1767, Herder met Goethe, who obtained him in position of court preacher. So he was uh, in German literature. He was uh, independent, and he became criticized for his influence uh, later in romantic thinking. Then you have Hoblock, and his was important in that he attacked the organized religion, finding their most famous expressions in what he wrote, uh, and he was then a friend of Voltaire. Then you have David Hume, and we know Hume from that Enlightenment work. He was uh, at the British Embassy in Paris. His best-known work is three volumes on the Treatise of Human Nature, and once again, uh, he began to take and uh, doubt his Christianity. Immanuel Kant was a Prussian, and his most famous works uh, were several, and the text which he did is What is the Enlightenment? The Critique of Pure Reason. John Locke, uh, he thinly hung on to his Christianity, and uh, he wrote quite a bit in his essays concerning human understanding in 16, of 1690, challenging Descartes. Um, Anyway, there was a lot there. He was forced to flee England for Holland in 1683 because of his links to plot to, against the king. Uh, then Montesquieu, we know Montesquieu quite a bit. We heard Melanchthon Smith quote from Montesquieu. Uh, his greatest work is The Spirit of the Laws, and uh, very interesting work. Isaac Newton, uh, some people say he kicked it all off with natural philosophy, then you have Quinet. The other ones that are the most evil of all is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was a big one um, when he took and he really came after the destruction of Christianity. He was huge uh, in the whole idea of the French Revolution. Turgot, he was another one, and Voltaire as well. Uh, this reference from thoughtco.com uh, is in your references. The bottom line is that what we had were all these influencers that were free thinkers and that everybody could be a free thinker according to your conscience. But you know what? We'll leave the authority and supremacy of Christ out of it all. So what we end up with is the return once again to all of what we have in the perversions of people living in and of themselves. 
Well, Sam Adams knew the difference. The Anti-Federalists did. So come on back next week when we delve deeper into the Enlightenment when Samuel Adams returns. 